Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Today we will talk about equations and how to solve them using invariant transformations. Um, first of all, what is an equation? Well, everybody knows that something like x squared equals to 1 represents an equation. Right, that's absolutely correct. Um, but I would like to generalize this concept and basically talk about equations in general. What are equations in general? Well, look at this one. On the left side, you have some function, basically. x squared represents a function. So you can say that on the left, well, on the left side of the equation, we always have some kind of a function. Now, what is a function? Function is some kind of a combination of domain where arguments are taken from, codomain, where the function takes value, and some kind of a rule which um, explains how to get from the domain to the corresponding um, value. Uh, so basically, these arrows represent represent the rules. So if you take this element of the domain, the function transforms it into this element of a codomain, from this to this, etc. That's the concept of function. Codomain, a domain, codomain, and certain set of rules. So in this particular case, we usually are talking about some algebraic expression of a function, which basically assumes that domain and codomain are numerical. Um, now, um, usually, the most frequently, I would say, case in uh, algebra uh, is when the function is considered to be defined on the, co on, on the domain and codomain uh, real numbers. Sometimes it's complex numbers. Uh, sometimes equation is defined on a set of integer numbers. Actually, uh, one of the most famous equations in, ma in the history of mathematics, um, uh, which presented by um, presented by the famous French mathematician Fermat, um, was actually an equation in the integer numbers, the great theorem of Fermat. Um, but anyway, in, usually in, in, in school, uh, in algebra, people are considering most often the, the equations were both domain and codomain and real real numbers, and uh, f of x rep is represented by some kind of algebraic expression of x squared. So that's on the left. On the right, since function um, takes values in the area of codomain, and we're talking about equality, then basically the element which is supposed to be on the right is an element of the codomain. Well, basically, that's what the equation is. It's the algebraic expression of a function defined on certain numerical domain, usually real or complex numbers, and it takes values in the corresponding real or complex numerical numbers. And on the right, uh, we have one particular element from the codomain, and that's the equality uh, between them, and it represents an equation. So what is an equation? We understand. Next is basically uh, what is the solution of this equation, because the purpose of the equation is basically to solve it, obviously. So what is a solution? Well, let's talk about this graphically again. If this is an element B, which I'm talking about right now, then to solve equation means to find all elements from the domain which are mapped by this function into this element b. Let's say it's a1 and a2. By the way, it's not necessarily that we have any solution to the equation in this domain. Maybe there is none. So there are certain values in the codomain which are not uh, values of this particular function uh, defined in a particular argument. Um, Another case is when we have only one uh, element of the domain which is 
uh, transformed by the function into this element b. Or we can many. Um, let me exemplify it. This particular equation, x squared equals 1, um, has uh, two um, solutions in the area of complex number, uh, if in the area of real numbers even, uh, plus and minus 1. Because 1 squared is 1, and minus 1 squared is 1. So we have two solutions in the area of um, real numbers. Now, uh, if I will tell you that, OK, I would like to solve this solution, uh, this equation, uh, in the area of positive numbers, then I have only one solution, only one, because minus 1 doesn't belong to my domain. Function was defined originally in a set of positive numbers only. So there is no solution. Another example would be if I have an equation of x squared equals to minus 1, which obviously has no solutions in the area of uh, real numbers, but it has two solutions among the complex numbers, plus i and minus i. Both squared gives you minus 1. So, it's very important from the very beginning when we are talking about equation to talk about the function and how it's defined. This particular function on the left should be completely defined, which means there is a domain and there is a codomain and there are rules. In this particular case, if we are saying that the domain is real, no solutions. If we are saying that the domain is complex, a uh, set of complex numbers, we have two solutions. Okay. Done with that. So we know what is an equation. It's an algebraic expression of the uh, equality between a certain function and certain element of its uh, codomain. We know what the solution is. That's the zero, one, or many different values of the domain which are transformed into this particular element of the, uh, of the codomain. So now, probably the most important question is how to solve equations. And uh, I'm sure you all know that uh, there are tons of different ways to solve different equations. There are certain techniques. And uh, the goal which I'm trying to achieve here is to generalize the process of solving equation. And this generalization I would like to present using the concept of invariant transformations. All right, so let's think about what is invariant transformation, and let me start from the example. If you have something like x plus 10 equals 13, and uh, I would like to solve this particular equation, um, let's talk for definitiveness, definitiveness that we are talking about real numbers. Well, again, uh, I'm sure everybody knows that uh, what we can do is we can subtract 10 from both sides of the equation and we will get basically x equals 3. But, now, but, but what did we do actually? And that's what's very important. I said we subtracted 10 from both sides of the equation. Well, we transformed one equation, original one, into a new one, which is simpler. So this transformation of the equation is the basis which I'm just trying to talk about when I'm talking about solutions, general solutions to the equations. We are transforming equations into a different type, which might be simpler, like in this particular case, and deliver a solution. So that's what transformation is. We are transforming original equation into a different one. Now, how can it be generalized? Okay, um, let's consider that, again, we have this domain, codomain, and the function f. This is domain, this is codomain. Now, in this case, let's consider that both of them are real numbers. Again, it doesn't really matter. So, what we did we applied the same transformation to both sides. Now, both sides are elements of the codomain, right? Because this is the function, which has values in the codomain, and this is the element of the codomain. 
So both sides have been transformed and we actually were still within the codomain because this is still codomain and this is still an element of the codomain. So what did we do? From one element of the codomain, this or this, we basically moved to another element of the codomain. Well, this is a transformation. Well, another word for this is a function, by the way. So we applied another function on both sides of the equation. In this case, the function is what? Basically, the function is x minus 10. That's the general algebraic expression of the function, which we have applied to both sides. x, in the first case, is this x plus 10. And with minus 10, it will be only x. On the second, on, on, on the right side of the equation, x is 13, and x minus 10 is 3. So we have applied a function which is defined in the codomain and takes values in the codomain, and it's a algebraic expression, it's x, x minus 10. So what basically it means from the general standpoint is, let's consider we have a function t of x, which transforms the same codomain which was here into itself somehow. This is my function x minus 10. From any element of the codomain, which happen to be real numbers in this case, um, my function value is this element minus 10. So that's the transformation which I have applied. Now, what kind of transformations can be applied? Any? Well, not quite. And here is why. What we would like to have is, we would like to have transformed equation to be absolutely equivalent to the original one. Equivalent in what way? Well, every solution of this one should be a solution of this, and every solution of this should be a solution of that. So these two equations are supposed to be completely equivalent. What's required of this transformation for the solutions to be completely equivalent? Again, let me give you an example. What if instead of this transformation, x minus 10, on this equation, I would have another um, transformation. Uh, transformation of this type, x minus 10 square. It's a transformation, it's a function which is defined on the same set of real numbers. Now if I define this function to the left part of the equation, so instead of x I will substitute x plus 10, I will have on the left x squared, right? x minus x plus, plus 10 minus 10 squared. On the right I will have what? I will have 13 minus 10, which is 3 square 9. So that's my transformed equation. Well, I can say, hey, this is an easy equation. I know that the square of 3 is 9, but, well, the square of minus 3 is also 9. So this equation has two different solutions, 3 and minus 3. Original equation, obviously, has only 3. Minus 3 doesn't fit. So this transformation is not good. This transformation changes the equation to something which is not equivalent. So somewhere, somehow, I have to generalize the concept of transformation which transforms my original equation into another one which is completely equivalent. And here is how it's done, how this generalization is done. Let's consider this function t of x. What I'm say, stating right now is that if t of x is representing a function which is one-to-one -one correspondence between its arguments and its values, one-to-one -one correspondence, it means that I can always not only go from argument to a value, but also from the value back to the same argument, then the function t of x is a valid transformation for our equation for any equation, actually. So only functions which represent one-to-one -one correspondence between arguments and values fit to our um, uh, transformations which we can use to solve equations. 
Now, what it means is the following. Um, I can take any value of this function, and what I'm saying is that I can always find original argument of this function uh, which resulted in this value if applied the function t of x. What it means from another standpoint is that I have another function which usually is uh, symbolically represented t to the power of minus 1. It's just a symbolic, has nothing to do with power. It's a symbolic representation of inverse function. So the function t minus 1 of x is actually works this way. It's defined where the t of x has values, which means here, and its values are where the arguments of the original function is, and it works in a completely reverse fashion. So the arrows, it's the same arrows, but directed differently to, to an opposite side. So these two functions are inverse to each other, and only those functions t of x, which have inverse function, are allowed to be called invariant transformations of our equations. Function x minus 10 is obviously inversible. Uh, the inverse function is x plus 10. Function x minus 10 squared is obviously not inversible because there are always two different values of x for any value of argument x for any value um, of this function. Like for instance, to get uh, to 9, I can have either uh, x equals to 13, so it will be 3 squared is equal to 9, or I can get 7, 7 minus 10 minus 3 squared, again 9. So I have two different arguments, uh, 7 and 13, which go to, which are transformed by this function into 9. And if I have two different arguments which are transformed into the same value, then there is no inverse, obviously, because I cannot say what's the uh, inverse function of 9. It can be either 7 or 13, and if I have two different values, it's not a function anymore. Function is always something which you can definitely say what exactly uh, is the result of this function. And reverse function does not really exist in this particular case. So, when we are talking about invariant transformation, we are talking about those functions, g of x, defined on the codomain of our original function f, which have inverse. Now, what I'm saying is that applying this transformation transforms our original equation like this to equivalent. Now, if I apply my transformation t on the left part, I will have this. On the right part, I have this. So if my original equation is this, and transformation is x minus 10, for instance, then I apply x minus 10 to this, and I get x plus 10 minus 10, which is x, and on this. 13 minus 10 will be 3. And that's how I get x equals to 3. Using the transformation t of x equals x minus 10. That's an example. Now, let me prove that this particular equation is exactly equivalent to the original one. Because that's the purpose of this transformation. I have to transform into something simpler. But that should be equivalent. OK, so that's what we are getting into right now. We have to prove that these two equations are completely equivalent, which means every solution of this is a solution of this, and vice versa. If I have a solution of this equation, then it will be a solution of that equation. All right, let's consider that um, A is a solution of original equation. And that means that f of a is equal to b. OK, now, what it means is, this is 
uh, a is an element of the domain of function f, f at a is an element of a codomain, and b is also an element of codomain. If I, if I have two different uh, elements I can always of the codomain, I can always apply a function t. But this is exactly the same element. So applying the function t to the same uh, argument will obviously give me the same um, value. So I can say that t from f of a is obviously equal to t of b, because f of a and b are two equal arguments, and that's why the function results in the same value. So the direct theorem is very simple. It's trivial, actually. What's important is uh, the converse theorem. So let's go back. This is not even a theorem. This is just a joke. Now, the real one is, well, what, what if a, a is a solution of this equation? So I know that g of f of a equals to g of b. So that what it means that the a is the solution of this equation, of this equation. Now, and here, the invariant transformation, the property of invariant transformation to always have inverse, that's where it's very important. And that's where it plays the most important role. Here is how. Now, I know that A is a solution. So these are two uh, uh, identical elements uh, of the uh, of the codomain. Okay. And I also know that T has an inverse function, which we called T of minus, T minus 1. So if I will apply T minus 1 to T of f of a, I will have exactly the same as t minus 1 applied to t of b. Well, since these are identical, then applying a function t to the minus 1, which is inverse function to t, will give me the same values. But now let's think about what this represents. Well, f of a is certain element of, a, uh, of the codomain of a. t transforms it to something. But I know that t minus 1 is inverse to t, which means it returns back from the value to the argument. So again, if this is my codomain, function t goes this way, function t minus 1 goes back. That's the definition of the inverse function. It's defined from here to here. And the result of t minus 1 of inverse function to t is the original argument from which we started. So by definition of the inverse function, left part is equal to f of a. And the right part, for the same reason, by definition of the inverse function is b. That actually should be very clear. The fact that inverse function, inverse t of t of b is b, basically by definition of the inverse function. And we have assumed that inverse function exists for this uh, transformation t. So from existence of this inverse function, we, solved basic, we, have, we have concluded, basically, that if A is a solution of this transformed equation, then A is a solution of the original equation. So we have proved right now that both equations have exactly the same set of solutions. If solution is here, then it's here. Or if it's here, then it's there. So they, that basically um, kind of explains what we do when we try to solve equations using our, uh, I would say, habitual uh, ways, which everybody is learning uh, at school. We know that we can subtract, for instance, the same number from both sides of the equation, like in this particular case. We can subtract 10, we are saying. Well, what does it mean we can subtract 10? It means we can apply an invariant, tra an invariant transformation of type 
g of x equals x minus 10. If, this, if we apply this transformation to this uh, equation, we will get x equals 3, and that's basically a trivial solution of this thing. And this transformation is obviously reversible, and the reversible function is x plus 10. One is subtracts 10, another is adds 10. And obviously these two transformations are uh, inverse to each other. Because think about this, g minus 1 of g of uh, x. I was saying that by definition it should give x, right? Well, let's just think about it. Uh, from g of x, I can substitute x plus 10, uh, sorry, minus 10. But g minus 1 of this means this plus 10. Obviously, I get x as a result. That's what it means that the functions are inverse to each other. So basically, again, what I'm saying is that the rules which we have learned in school that we can subtract the same number from both sides of the equation are actually a particular representation of this invariant transformation of this type. Now, another rule. For instance, we have an equation 2x equals 8. Well, everybody knows we can divide both sides, both sides of the equation by some number, which is not equal to 0, obviously. If you divide it by 2, we will get x equals 4. What does it mean from the general standpoint? It means that we apply transformation equals to 1 half of x. So if we apply this transformation to the left part, we will have two times 1 half of x, which is x. And on the right, 8 applied to it will be 4. Now, what's the inverse function in this case? Obviously, it's 2x. If you apply first this and then that, you will return back to x. First from x to 1 half of x, then multiply by 2 will be x again. So, both sides of the equation can be multiplied or divided by not equal to 0, <coughs> or multiplied by not equal to 0, uh, by the same number. Oh, by the way, why is it not 0? Why can I say that I can multiply both, both sides of the equation by 0? Uh, well, for obvious reason. If function is this, zero, then there is no t minus one of x. There is no inverse function. There is no such thing as a function which returns back to the original. Because if you uh, take, for instance, value of two, for instance, you get zero. So from two, you get zero. But if you get value of 22, it will also give you 0. So this is not a one-to-one -one correspondence. t of x does not represent a one-to-one -one correspondence. And that's why many different, actually infinitely many different value uh, arguments are resulting in the same value. So there is no way I can go back. I don't know from 0 where the, the original argument came from. So that's why we cannot multiply, and obviously cannot divide, by zero as an invariant transformation. OK. Um, what if you have an equation of a different sort? Um, let's say. Uh, x squared equals to 4. Well, you know that 2 and minus 2 both are solutions to this particular equation, right? So let's apply a transformation, um, which is a mistake in this particular case, and uh, extract the square root from both sides. Well, I can say that square root of x2 is equal to square root of 4 x equals 2. Is it right? No, it's absolutely incorrect. 
it's absolutely wrong. Why? Because the square root is not an invariant transformation in this particular case. And as a result of applying a non-invariant transformation, we have lost one solution, which is minus 2. This equation has only solution x equals 2. This solution obviously has 2 and minus 2. So by applying non-invariant transformation, we have lost one of the roots, one of the solutions of the equation. So square root is not uh, an invariant transformation. How about cubical root? Well, actually it is. And here is why. Let's exemplify it on a uh, graph. Um, y equals cubical root of x, which is the same as x to the minus one, one third, power of minus one third, has a graph which looks like this. This is one. One minus one minus one. So this is the graph. And it's very easy to see from the graph that it represents a one-to-one -one correspondence between arguments. These are arguments on the x-axis. And values on the y. Because for every x, I have one and only one y. And for every y, I have only one x. So that's one-to-one -one correspondence. And that's very, very important. And square root is not such a thing. Because if this is y is equal to x, then it's very important actually. For positive y, this function is defined, and you can definitely get the value, the positive value of uh, uh, square root of it. But again, if, if, if you do the negative part, this would also be exactly the same thing. Like if this is 4 on y, this is minus 2, and this is 2. Both will give you, well, actually, I shouldn't say it this way. We are talking about a function which looks like this. Then we can go from y back to x. From x we square it, we get y. From y we go down by using x is equal to uh, square root of y. So the shape is like this. But in any case, whatever the shape is, the same y has basically two different value of x which, which correspond in, uh, uh, to this function. And since we have two different values, uh, we don't have a one-to-one -one correspondence, right? So, in this particular case, we do have a one-to-one -one correspondence, and that's why this function can be applied as an invariant transformation, and this function cannot. This is not a good one. Anyway, there are many different examples of invariant transformations, and basically, now I can uh, answer the question, how to solve equations. Okay, this is the general answer. We have to try to find invariant transformations which will transform your original equation into uh, something simpler. And the simpler one can probably be solved if you can transform it down to something like x is equal to 3. Then this basically represents a solution to your original equation. Um, sometimes it's easier to um, solve equations using these invariant, these invariant transformations by um, basically breaking 
um, the domain into different parts and in certain part use one particular transformation and in another part use another. And I will just exemplify it in this particular case, in this equation. How can I solve this equation without actually using the square root? I said that we cannot use the square root, but, but here is how. I know that the domain of this is all real numbers, right? So let's just divide this domain into two halves. One is positive numbers, and another is negative numbers. If x is only positive numbers, then function is invariant transformation. If x only the positive number, y is a positive number, and we can always square y to get the positive number, and we will get x. And there is no problem with this. Now, in the negative part, in the negative part, we can always apply a transformation minus x. So, let's do it. If x greater than 0, or if it doesn't matter. We apply this, and we get x is equal to 2. We're talking about positive numbers only. Now, in the negative numbers, if x is negative, then what I can say is, I can apply square root of x, uh, of minus x, and uh, what will I have? Um, hmm. If x is, no, that's probably not exactly correct. I think let's just use a different function. Let's use this function. Here. This transformation. Square root of x squared is x, but now we have a minus, right? Here. So minus x is equal to 2. That's what we'll do. x squared goes to this. And square root of x squared gives you x. And this minus in front will give you this. Or from this, we can multiply both by minus 1. We get x equal to minus 1. So now, since we have divided our domain into two parts, and use two different invariant transformations uh, in each part, then we are OK. And we have two solutions, and we have not lost things. Well, I was trying to be as smooth as possible. There are certain things which I really have to think twice about. Well, but that just, just proves that this is not like obvious thing from the very beginning. And um, uh, as long as you understand that invariant transformation is the generalized method to solve equations, that's great. And a technique of dividing the domain into different parts where you can define different invariant transformations, that's the proper way of solving equations of this type where you don't really have an invariant easy invariant transformation which can be applied to an entire domain. Well, that's it for today, and uh, thank you very much.